Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the next presentation um, on an e-prescription for improved trust, relationships, information, and communication. Um, I'm going to let the presenters um, introduce themselves and walk through the presentation. And then afterwards, um, we will have a Q&A. So thank you all so much for uh, joining us uh, this afternoon. My name is Jerry Bomblatt, and um, I am uh, been working in health literacy, patient communication, and education and engagement for over 20 years. I also serve on PCORI's Patient Engagement Advisory Board and the Leadership Board for the Journal of Patient Experience. Uh, with me today is Iran Kabakov, who is both a physical practicing physical therapist and the CEO and co-founder of a uh, e-learning patient education platform called DACALA, as well as Kimberly Manning, who is both a nurse, but maybe more importantly today, joins us as a patient. So I'm gonna jump right in. Oh, if it will let me, here we go. Um, so there's a lot of challenges we know when we're talking for patients. They feel scared and alone. They're not feeling well. We know working memory is very small, so they're only going to remember a small amount of what we tell them. There's the social determinants of health, and of course, they need to find trusted clinicians. And the care team has challenges as well. You're trying to build trust and relationships with really limited time with uh, in an efficient way and a consistent way. You're also trying to personalize the information, ensure understanding, and chart and document all of this. So it's a lot that we're trying to do. And when any of those things break down, it can undermine trust, but when any of those things are good, it can help build trust. And what I really wanna spend just a couple of minutes on is looking at what patients really want, because we really wanna talk about how you can use that time before, after, and between visits or hospitalizations to communicate better with patients and families and build that trust. And what people really want is to have a good mental model or gist of what's going on, right? They're kind of lost in at sea, uh, even sometimes people within healthcare, they really want complete information that connects the dots for them and addresses their worries and their concerns. So when we look at the research on why people go to the web and search before they come to a visit, um, they're trying to understand their symptoms. They're trying to manage the condition. They're actually trying to figure out, do I even need to go in and see somebody or am I just kind of freaking out and blowing this up in my own head? Um, they really want to be able when they come in to to appear to you like they have their act together. They wanna be able to describe the problem and have good questions. And actually the other reason they're searching online is they're trying to prepare themselves for the medical jargon that may be coming at them. And uh, they know that there's gonna be limited time, but they really do want to be seen as prepared and competent and as the experts in what's going on with them. And when we look at why people search after visits, um, they're often trying to clarify what they heard from clinicians or there's outstanding new questions sometimes that they want, so they wanna understand more. Other times people are simply curious and wanna dig into things. And if they're told that there's no treatment for what they have, they kinda wanna go out there and investigate or if they don't really love what the treatment option is, they might go looking for other options or looking for a second opinion to make sure that, you know, their diagnosis is correct and matching up and, and just making sure that they have all the possible information. The other thing people are really looking for is others' experiences. What is it like to live with this condition or live through the experience of taking this medication or having this procedure? They really online like this idea of getting kind of comfort and support while kind of having that emotional distance. So you can hear from a lot of people without necessarily having to uh, go deep with that. 
Uh, they also want insights and candor. So they want to know, like, tell me the real deal. I don't, I want to know what I'm actually getting into. They want to know how others cope and they want to know that candor again, the reality of a condition or a treatment. What is the recovery like? You know, what, what is really going to happen to them? Unfortunately, what we also know is that when people do online health searches, they themselves say that they often can't appraise the information to know, is this not just trustworthy and correct? Is it up to date? And is it appropriate to me in my current situation? So you might look up breast cancer and find perfectly good information on breast cancer, but maybe you have DCIS or some other related condition where you're not realizing that you're reading about something that's actually different than what you have. And people say that it's also, there was a study showing that it's also hard, harder to distinguish between true and false information, health information after reviewing poor information. So even if most of what you're looking at is good, if you read something that's unreliable, but it's outlier information, it starts putting questions in your head like, oh, maybe that other information was wrong. So the unfortunate fallout of this is people often feel really overwhelmed and anxious from doing these searches. I think we've all sat down at the computer thinking, oh, I'll just spend 15 minutes and two hours later, you are still there reading stuff and more confused than ever. Um, Unfortunately, it does mean that patients might question the information their doctor is giving them. That's both a good and a bad thing, I think, but it, it leads to this, you know, difficult interaction um, and these tensions with the patient-physician relationships. And studies also show that in cases, people even do things like postpone an appointment because they're not sure that this makes sense for them. Now, the good news is, is that recent surveys show that trust in clinicians overall is still pretty high in society. And when you compare that to trust in websites and social media and what people explicitly don't trust, it's in pretty good shape. And I know that Michael and others were talking earlier about, well, there's trust in organizations there's kind of this idea and trust in clinicians generally. And then there's, do you trust the clinician in front of you right now? So this is more trust in clinicians generally, but the good news is we're starting from a pretty good place. Um, and really when we look at some of the, the ways people have investigated trust, the two components that often bubble up and it's often referred to as um, the universal dimensions of social cognition, talk about health literacy unnecessarily long-term for something, where people really talk about trust as being a combination of warmth. So like good relationships, do you have my, do I believe that you have my best interests at heart and competence? Do I think you know what you're doing? Um, and so when we look at how this plays out in health information, you know, we get back to that challenge where there can really be tension when the information a clinician is giving you doesn't match what you found in a web search. And uh, the other interesting studies is that initially, people really value knowledge and competence. First, they want to find out, do I think you know what you're talking about? So that um, big health search can undermine that if there's not agreement with what the clinician is saying. But then once people are engaged and they've decided, okay, this clinician knows their stuff, uh, the focus really shifts to feeling valued as a person and that warmth component. So do I feel listened to and understood? Am I getting person-centered care? And am I being given information that I can understand? And so what's interesting is we know that what patients want is they don't want to do the web search. They don't want to go online and get lost in these rabbit holes or even reading good information. It's exhausting, it's confusing. Most people want appropriate, reliable online health information from their clinician. And that good quality information then gives them confidence when they come in and talk to their clinician. So instead of people kind of already being like, oh, I don't know if they're gonna like what I found online, if the clinician gave it to them, 
and they trust it, you're already on a better footing. And people, uh, when they are referred to high quality health information, uh, there are studies showing that this promotes that psychological security when communicating with people. And I think, you know, I still feel that way when I go in to see my doctor that there might be some tension. So anything that reduces that would be great. I can't imagine if you're from uh, an underserved population or a minority group, like that's just gonna amplify those feelings. So incredibly important. So what we really wanna focus on today is this opportunity that really goes along with everything that everybody else has been saying to really flip the clinic and pre-educate people or educate them after visits as well to kind of reinforce what was said. And this really lets people review information before they come in so you can have a better conversation. Uh, people see you're not just talking, you know, off the cuff, but you've thoughtfully, proactively given them these resources that were prepared for them. And um, when you e-prescribe information, it allows you to track and document it. Another thing I want to say, there's been a lot of talk today about family caregivers, which is phenomenal. As a family caregiver for my mom, I want that information because I often can't be there at the appointment. So if I get to see the same thing she sees, that gives me a lot of confidence in what's going on. Because when you come into that in-person visit, there's a lot of impression management and issues with psychological safety. There's an inherent power dynamic, no matter how great the clinician is, you're still the patient coming in to see somebody, you're a little bit at their mercy. Um, we all want our clinicians to think well of us. A lot of people don't want to be a bother. There's that time pressure. And, you know, when it's tight like that, then clinicians don't get a good understanding of what we're worried about, our health status, or what we're willing and able to do. So we want to free up that time where people are just repeating themselves, giving the same basic information so that people can come in and have a better conversation. And this is even more profound with stigmatized issue like, you know, sexual health or mental health, things like that. And what's great too is in an online setting, and I think we've all experienced this for all the concerns people have about privacy, people feel much safer disclosing information in an online setting. And part of that is you're just at home by yourself. You feel like you're in a safe space. You have time. There's not that person in front of you kind of waiting for your answer. And even if they're not judging you, you might feel like they're judging you. But it creates this sense of invulnerability to criticism, privacy, and this idea that your responses just kind of disappear into the computer. So even though you know they're going to somebody, it still gives you that openness. Um, and as you can see at the bottom here, one person said, well, a human being would be judgmental, but I shared a lot of personal information online because a real person wasn't asking me. And interestingly, when people do self-disclose, which they're more likely to do in an online setting, that actually builds trust. So a study of 63,000 patients and 1,500 physicians found that when patients do self-disclose something, say about their mental health or whatever it might be, that they experience their own honesty and transparency as a form of autonomy and control over their health. I have decided to share this with you, and this is me taking control of the situation and letting you into what's going on. And it shows they have more trust in clinicians. So now I want to hand it over to a clinician, Iran, who can talk about this idea of curating and e-prescribing information. Thank you. So yes, I think that uh, the the subjects that I've here I've been hearing prior uh, in, in at the conversation and the presenters before us uh, was about a lot about building trust through communication. Now, as a clinician, and I've been I've been um, involved in healthcare for for about thirty years, majority of it as a physical therapist. Uh, I've I have seen the progression of uh, my encounters change because of many things, whether it's regulation or insurance coverage, um, or, or just you know more people needing care. 
Uh, and what I've recognized the most is that well beyond what I'm doing as a clinician, hands-on treating per people, uh, what makes the encounter better is if I have the time and ability to communicate with the patient. So, you know, when I was starting uh, 20, 20 some years ago, uh, working in the clinic, uh, I recognized that I was losing the time with patients and I started playing with technology to enable me to share the information I thought was important with the patient before or after the encounter. Uh, and really that's what uh, the, the slide here is showing is that today, much more than back then, I have the ability to go search for information that is available, curate it, make it into a module and prescribe it to patients over uh, the internet using, using the, the right technology, um, enables me to give them that feel that they are uh, first of all heard, but also that they, that they are getting what they need from me. Uh, and so really I'm utilizing the technology to help me build the trust, even though I'm not physically there uh, with the patient. And I'll show you in a second how I interject myself into the uh, into the conversation. So if you could uh, move to the next slide. Um, so yes, you know, curating uh, and e-prescribing, and, and I like that word e-prescribe, right? We we always think of e-prescribing as medication. I think that communication is just as important, if not more, than the medication. And e-prescribing information is is critical, in in my opinion. The um, the the amount of content that is third party created that is great because. It's the right reading level, you know, it's the right health literacy. It has all the components that we need for the materials to be uh, great. You know, it, it's, it is already available. There, there are libraries of digital information. But what I like about the model that we are talking about today is that I have the ability to take my personality, my experience and bookend that information by uploading my own materials into uh, the module and basically uh, well, I would say customizing the, the content that is available already with uh, what my patients need. So just as an example, most of my courses, I'll call it, that I prescribe patients has a, an intro by me. Now, it's not that I'm introing personally to the patient, but it looks like that I, I do. I basically have a generic introduction. Hi, you know, I'm so glad you're here. This information is really important. And it's going to discuss this subject. When you're done, you know, call the office and let's take the next step. Uh, at the end of my courses, I like to add a small funny video from YouTube, right? And that enables me to do two things. One is it's a surprise. It's a little Easter egg of sorts to, for the patient when they get to the end. Uh, but it's a cheat for me because when they walk through the door and they get in the clinic, they'll say, oh, that video was really funny. And that's my checkbox. I already know that they've watched everything that I want them to watch. So I'm, I'm saving myself the, uh, the time and energy. And when I do talk to other clinicians about sharing information and curating information, I do get that. Well, but, you know, the EMR does it. And I always say, but does it really? You know, can you can you really curate a video into uh, Epic or Cerner? And the answer is no, you cannot. There's there's a, this it's a misconception. You can maybe get them to upload a PDF, um, but that's, in my opinion, a, a very small portion of what patients need in order to build trust with me as a clinician. I'm not even talking about taking care of themselves. I'm just talking about having that relationship and uh, rapport so i'm going to go to the next slide so what does it what would it look like for me to to uh upload information to the web so first before i even go into what's happening here on the screen i have to recognize that there are regulations and uh, uh, restrictions on that and so we have to take consideration uh, hipaa into it and and secure it you know information security 
uh, and personal information security, not just necessarily healthcare. Uh, so I need something that that enables me to collect information and uh, abide by by these uh, by these rules. So here, what you're seeing is basically how uh, you know a, a platform that you choose to use would should or would look like. Um, and on the screen, I have uh, the ability to either upload a file, um, and that's the icon with the little up arrow. Uh, next to it, I have the ability to create a video, you know, using a webcam or my or a cell phone. I can bring in content from other website using the link. Uh, why, if there are, if there's so many materials that are available for free, that are amazing, uh, that I can bring into the conversation, I'd like to do it in in a single online encounter. I don't want to send my patients six different links, one to the um, uh, to the CDC or Medline and then uh, my website. I want them to go in, log in and view the information in succinct order. So linking information is is critical in my again, in my opinion. And then we can do a little I can create a little review. That's the check mark or I can create a survey and ask for questions. And all that happens right here. And it's nice and simple. And so I'll go to the next slide. So that's what it looks like when I have uh, content available. Um, this, this actually shows a, a library and the information here uh, is from third parties, right? So those are available for me within, within uh, the, the well, I'll say on the internet and then within this platform. And I can pick and um, add those into my into my own library. So I'm like, we're gonna go to the next slide. And this is what it would look like uh, when I take those items and put them in order. So as I mentioned, I will usually put my uh, a quick intro by me. I want the patients to recognize that it's me, that I took the time to curate the information for them uh, and then I'm using two items that are not that I wasn't created that's just available from the CDC and at the end I created a quick uh, uh, I call it a quiz or review and that helps the patient recognize whether they understood the information or not it's not something they get graded on but if they answer an, uh, a question incorrectly there's a very immediate cue to hey you know try again right and then so they can get the information they need either by going back and viewing the information again or just answering the question uh, right here. So once I'm happy with this succession of content, I publish it. And then on the next slide, um, I see what happens with that content once I prescribe it to patients. Um, and again, I, I think there's a big delta between what's happening on the EMR on a, you know as far as collection of information it's very that that's a clinical bank of information communication is a separate channel uh, and it doesn't really the, the the EMRs don't provide me as a clinician enough data on what the what is the patient doing with the material so here this is a demo of course and I can see that uh, my patient Beth finished the first course and is 71% through the second one. Uh, I see Keith completed the information. So my encounter with them can now be directed much better, right? I don't have to cover all the information that I would with, with Beth and, and Keith about getting ready for surgery because I know they both finished it. Um, with Beth, I might ask more questions about preparing you know, for her upcoming uh, labor and delivery. So that enables me to to um, not just support the patient outside of the clinic, but have a much more intimate conversation in the office. They when when I say I I I looked on the I looked on the platform and I saw that you didn't finish watching the course. They go oh so you you actually pay attention to that okay you know and so it 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 shows that I'm caring to them uh it also helps me because it makes them feel a little funny and the next time they come around they watched it so it's good that way 
So I'm going to look, move on, on to the next uh, slide. So, uh, you know, very important is what is the patient seeing? So this is what the patient would um, experience, right? They, they, th this is what the patient will see. It's very simple. They get to a page. It's not complicated. You know, it's basically they, they click the button that says start course and they view the information in uh, chronological order. And they, you know, and when they complete on the right hand side, you see there's the options There's a little bubble with the uh, with the like like a comment. And that really is a um, it's a star rating system, just like you would see on Amazon or uh, you know, Google, where you, you're you basically saying, you know, did, did I like it? And that information is really simple. Uh, or, no, that information is really important for me because it simplifies the the uh, assessment process on whether my content is good or not. Uh, patients are very good about saying, you know, this technology does not work for me at all. Or this, you know, this course is, is you know, was really boring. I've heard this both. Uh, and so when that happens, I'm able to go back and make changes as as needed. And so the next slide. So I think we're going to take a switch shift now perspectives for Kim to talk about her experience as a patient. Uh, Kim had an interesting experience, both trying to do something uh, in person versus the same process virtually. So. Kim, if you want, I can also stop sharing if you just, or if you just, I know you don't have slides, you were more just going to speak to your experience. Yeah, but can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Um, so like Jerry was saying, I actually um, have a very unique perspective on the education that was provided for me because um, I actually had a weight loss surgery. Um, I had actually in 2021, so we, we were deep in the COVID at that time. However, about two years prior, I had started the procedures and the classes, and there's a lot of education um, prior to surgery. So prior to 2021, I think it was actually 2019, I had to take off of work. I had to go sit in a classroom setting with people that I did not know. Um, my surgeon was there, also a nurse. Um, she was like a nurse navigator that kind of helped patients through the process. Um, they were there. We were given information. We had little booklets. Um, you didn't really feel, I don't think anybody felt comfortable to really ask any of the hard questions or things that probably were very personal because you're in a room with like 20 people that you've never seen before and hope you never see again, actually. Um, and, you know, it was like an hour away from me. I had to drive, you know, an hour there, an hour back. I literally chickened out and didn't, I just didn't do the procedure. 2021 rolls around and in my mind, I say, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. And my nurse navigator said, well, Kim, we, we're starting something new to do the patient education because we have to do education. It's, it's just mandatory. And they actually had this program that Iran and Jerry have been talking about. And it was absolutely fantastic for me because I did not have to take off from work. I didn't have to drive an hour to the clinic and an hour back. I didn't have to sit in a room with people I didn't know. I could ask questions because my nurse navigator had, you know, emailed me the link like Iran explained. And I could certainly email back my questions or I could write them down and then my next visit asked when I was one on one. But it was nice because I could do the training. I could look at the education on my own time in my own house. In my, in my pajamas, you know, um, I could have my husband there because for a sleeve gastrectomy, the norm, he's not, he's not medical. So when I'm saying all excited about a surgery, oh, they're going to remove, 
you know, 70 to 80 percent of my stomach, you know, the first thing that people are thinking is, you know, can you live like that? Are you going to have some kind of bag attached to you? What, you know, like what, how does this work? It sounds really crazy. But by using the docula experience and using that tool, my clinicians were able, I was able to share that educational experience with my husband, who was going to be my caregiver. And the education went over things to prepare for the procedure, but also life after the procedure. So I was able to prepare ahead of time. Uh, there were things that I knew I wanted to order from Amazon because it was suggested. I knew what type of diet I was going to be on. My husband would be prepared as well because he would see that as well. And the education was done so well that even somebody that was had never heard of this procedure, was not in the medical field, was able to truly understand um, it all culminated into a situation where I rolled into surgery that day. My surgeon came in just as I was ready to roll into the OR and said, Kim, are you ready? I said, yes, I am ready. I, I'm not nervous. I honestly was not nervous. I felt prepared. I knew I had the things at home that I was going to need. And I said, come on, let's do it. And the only difference between the two situations prior to covid in 2019 and deep into COVID in 2021 was this educational experience. It was the same nurse navigator. It was the same surgeon. It was the same doctor's office. Um, so I have to really say that I think the education that I got really helped me um, be prepared and could kind of tackle this journey um, in you know, more head on. And I think my perspective as a nurse is one thing, but like Jerry said, more importantly, as a patient, it was much, much more um, meaningful to me. It made me understand that, you know, my caregivers care about me. They're doing everything they can. You know, everything was topsy-turvy during, during COVID. Everything was having to be um, rework, but a lot of things were being canceled, and my procedure was one that would have been canceled if there was not a way to do the education. There was no way they could have done the education without this tool because they didn't have a space large enough for us to be able to, um, to space out and be six feet apart. Um, certainly, our families wouldn't have been able to be involved. Like we said before, I wouldn't have felt comfortable to ask any personal or intimate type of questions. Um, and I would have had to drive an hour there and an hour back, sit there the whole time with a mask on. And um, it just wouldn't have been very personable for me. But this was just a great experience um, for me. And maybe to pull Iran back into the conversation, I know, Kim, uh, I think it was at the practice that you were going to where the the surgeon was originally uh, worried about doing the education online, thought it would be a worse experience for patients, yeah. but was kind of happy, not only that people like you were so happy with the education, but when they met what was happening before, it sounded like was people would cut, drive all the way in, sit, get a couple hours of education, and then be kind of exhausted, and then meet with the surgeon and not have a very good meeting because they were just kind of overwhelmed by everything. And it sounds like the, the surgeons were then happier with the, the patient visits because you came in, you weren't exhausted, you didn't just sit through a really long class. Was that your experience? And Iran, have you seen similar things? All the time. I think as a clinician, anytime a administration comes and says, we have new technology, I, I get a little bit of palpitation because that means uh, more more work is coming. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's um, uh, you know, so, so when, when I talk to clinicians about using technology like this, that, that's, the first, that's the first thing that comes to mind. But when I do the analogy to, well, are you using Instagram when you come home from work? And they go, oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, do you post stuff on Instagram? Oh, yeah, you know, or, or Facebook. Like, that's no, it's no different. It's just that it enables you to do the same 
conversation you have with your social media friends and and um, and people that you talk to online now you can do that in a meaningful clinical way right so that is there a um, initial time investment or energy investment in creating and curating the content yeah absolutely but to tell you that I've changed my sleeping position course since I created it I don't know, five, six years ago? No, because people are still people and they still need to sleep the right way. So I just I just keep reusing it. And so, yeah, I do see, you know, there's that shift of, of thought of like, oh, I don't know, you know, this is gonna, the patients are gonna think that I don't care about them because I send them information online. And the patients come back and say, oh my God, I love this. This is the best thing ever. So we we hear that all the time, yes. Yeah, and Kim, it sounds like I put this new slide up, but it sounds like that was your experience too, that you felt like you had, you said you had less anxiety, which has been borne out in the research and that your visits were better. Uh, did you end up doing, do you think less searching because you were given this information? I did not feel the need to search anything because my questions were answered. I still got written material as well, kind of as um, something for me to go back and reflect on or whatever. And I'm assuming that with this particular procedure, each practice and each surgeon kind of has their own twist to things. You know, I, it had all my information in it, my nutritionist information. It was just really, it was just really good because I, I knew I had that backup. So I didn't do any searching. And although I'm a nurse, this isn't in my realm of, you know, everyday nursing life. So this was just something that um, that was very helpful. And like I said, it really made me trust my surgeon more because I knew they had gone that F extra effort to make sure that I was able to get my procedure done, even though a lot of stuff around me had shut down and, and they were able to do um, that so do procedures you know this was considered an elective procedure so a lot of hospital systems shut that totally down but once they realized that patients were able to get the education and I think you know most of us I, I feel certain everybody feels ready after that um, or certainly much more prepared um, I think they realize we need to open this up and let's do this um, and in my in my nursing life, I've always been in the, on the administrative side. So from that perspective, you know, it, it was good to do it this way. It didn't take a surgeon out of the clinic for most of a, or half a day. It didn't take that nurse navigator out of the clinic for half a day or more to prepare, you know, for the session. Um, she, they, like Iran showed, they could clearly see if I completed the, the training or not. It was, that was there. They could track that. So it was a great experience for me. Yeah. So, I mean, that, and that resonates with what I've seen in the literature as, as well as my own experience is that people are really satisfied if it's well-designed information that meets their information needs. And there's also resources that show you know when possible being able to give people like things like animation can not just improve their recall but can really even improve their attitudes towards what's going on um i know this was done for example with colonoscopy they found that people had a better attitude towards having nobody's ever looking forward to that um but also i want to talk briefly about you know how much the quality matters in, in terms of that patient-centered design. Obviously, we want that information to be easy to understand and act on. I think a really big one, like Iran was saying, there's designing and testing it with patients, but this creates that ongoing feedback loop where you can see, well, how come 100% of people are completing this course and only you know, 50% are completing this course, or a patient comes in and says, that was really confusing, or I don't really know what that was supposed to tell me. You can, you can, you can get some feedback and go in and, and, and figure that out. Um, because people do really want to know that other patients have informed the content or that it's been social proofed, they say sometimes, and that it's really addressing their concerns. They want that sense making and extended logic. So when I've designed content, 
I know, for example, we would tell people who were having spine surgery, like, well, don't smoke. It can interfere with healing after surgery and you want your bones to heal well. That sounds like enough information, but it's often not. Like people have no understanding often that your bones need blood. And so just to take that extra like 15 seconds and say your bones need blood to heal. And if you smoke, it it reduces blood flow and can impact healing. It's that little extra step. And that's where I find you really have to test these things with patients because you know, a dental work, another one where people say, well, why do, why can't I get my teeth cleaned after I get hip replacement surgery? And it's like, how does it make sense that an infection in your mouth could cause an infection in your hip? You know, it's, you have to kind of, and then you really have to find out what are people's questions for it to make, again, coming back to that very first slide, what makes sense to people? So when I was creating resources for HRQ, um, you know, one of, it's not necessarily part of informed consent for understanding having a hysterectomy, but most women just wanted to know what happens. You just took this whole organ out of my body. What's going to happen to the space where my uterus was? So again, that's not like essential for informed consent, but for helping them make sense of the information, they were just thrilled to know that information or to understand, you know, okay, opioids, tough, tough thing to talk about in patient education. A lot of people are very worried they're going to get any opioids and they're scared. And other people are terrified, have had bad experiences, and they're terrified they're not going to get enough pain medication and their pain isn't going to be managed. So how, you have to test materials to make sure that both ends of that audience are going to be feel comfortable with what you're telling them. And then this came up before in some conversations about, um, you know, palliative care and end of life and things like that, that we need to really be candid with people, but that kind of compassionate candor to make sure that we're addressing any of those uncomfortable questions they have, or just the realities of, of what they're going to be dealing with. Um, like you were saying, Kim, right? Like you didn't feel comfortable in a group of strangers asking these very personal questions, but no, you could do it I, in an online I, setting. You know, I wasn't going to ask, and I have a big mouth and I felt uncomfortable. So I can only imagine those people that are much more timid. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so this is really our, our last slide, but Iran and Kim, if you want to, I mean, really, I think what we see is our experience has all been that if you can give people this information, they feel cared for, they feel like you went the extra mile, uh, to really meet their needs. It improves trust. It can, it means that they won't, they're less likely to, to do their own search where they may or may not come back with good information. And, um, yeah. And anything else you guys want to add? I'm just going to, I'm just going to answer a quick question. I see in the chat, what processes uh, do you have to keep uh, the content up to date resources for patients without digital access? So the first part is as far as keeping um, content up to date, when you, when you use the digital information, it actually makes it a whole lot easier to do because you will get questions from patients on a regular basis. And, it helps you recognize what needs um, adjusting as things move along. Uh, so whether if I'm if I'm a surgical practice and and there's a new new material, it's very easy for me to go into that course that is built like Legos and pull out the information about the procedure, and put a new put new materials in. Uh, so that's one thing. And of course, internally as a team, it always you always should have at least an annual. Uh, review of, of materials that you're using to make sure that everything is up to date. As far as resources uh, for patients without digital access, uh, what we see and what, what, I've, what I see is, is um, many practices, many clinics or organizations will have a uh, device in the office that they can loan the patient right there at the uh, either at the exam room or the waiting room. Uh, but, you know, I, I do think that there's there's access to to uh, to dig to there is more access nowadays to digital uh, devices to view it, but still, you know, we need to be 
cognizant and, and sensitive that the fact that some patients might not have it. And so making it available at the practice uh, is very easy because most of digital platforms nowadays will work, you know, will, will be uh, usable on, on even on a cell phone, right? So um, it becomes easier to make it accessible for, for, for those patients who need help. Um, and yeah, and I'm 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 just going to uh, close for 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 me. I mean, I, I think that again, as a clinician for myself, I find it crucial to make sure my communication with patients is as authentic and personal as possible. It enables me to find out more about what is it that brings them, brings them through the door. Uh, it helps me. And I wrote that in the comments. It helps me with my professional burnout because many times I'm, I, as a clinician, I feel like I'm, I'm on auto, uh, uh, you know, work, and I'm just pushing paperwork, and I'm dealing with insurance verifications, and and it's uh, that's not what I signed up for. And so when I sit in the office and I have a conversation with a patient, and it's and it's, you know, it's it's um, significant. It makes me feel so good that it helps that it, it gives me that balance. Um, and I, I really, re I would really uh, recommend that if you're a clinician, go out and search for, search for a, a technology that enables you to do it. I think it's going to change your life and your patient's lives. Yeah. And I want to say too, I know that you originally created like the screenshots you were showing of the platform you use to work with your own patients, but you pretty much make it available for anybody to use, right? Correct. Yes. So, so the platform that, that I use, I make available as is at no charge for any clinician organization or anything like that. I feel that it's my, my duty to do so. So it is available. Yes. Uh, it is available at no cost whatsoever. Um, it's if anybody wants, I mean, again, you can direct message me. I've put my email on the, on, in the chat and I'm, I'm happy to also help share my experience and best practices that I found at work uh, with anyone, because I think uh, I'm, this is my, my passion. I, I want better communication in healthcare. Yeah. And I think the other thing I would say is just as somebody who's been on the health literacy listservs and things like that for many, many years, is I feel like a lot of the traffic is people saying, hey, does anybody have a resource that addresses this? Or has anybody done anything that addresses this? And we really do need to kind of build out these content clearinghouses where we can share resources more easily and not just cross our fingers and hope that somebody happened to see our post. I mean, it's great that people do it, but it's kind of a lot of extra when we should be able to kind of go search. So I know um, the content clearinghouse is another place where people can add any resources they want to also share you know, with the larger community, because we don't all need to be reinventing content all the time. I know I've even had hospitals try and hire me to create content for like a decision aid for colon, can colon cancer screening. And I'm like, sure, but did you want to use one of the free ones that's already out there that has been validated with patients? <laughs> you know, it's, I think, great if we can find more ways to share, because it's, it's to create good content. It's a real effort. And I know a lot of people uh, who attend these create a lot of amazing resources. So. Yeah. Or maybe even if they're not creating it, they're looking for, you know, valid, reliable information, and they may not even know how to judge that. So having something like this is fabulous. Um, and then the approach that you take and understanding what the needs from what, what the patient wants, um, you know, what they're looking for in terms of, you know, de designing that knowledge base, that's, that's really critical. I think you've done a great job and presented so much valuable information for everyone. Thank, I you, see it. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Um, and thanks to you and the, uh, presentation right before yours, the, the panel. Um, this has been very uh, knowledgeable, very informative and um, useful information. Gives you a different perspective. I think, you know, you got to, for me personally, I got to go back and listen to the presentation over again and kind of 
look at, well, now what would I do differently or what will I do next? Yeah. Does anyone have any questions before we close out? We have one more presentation after this. You will, it's getting ready to start in two minutes. So um, you log out of here and go into the next link uh, for Dr. Sarma's presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, team.